out of an expression of your concerns entirely spontaneously in one of our uh, periods spent in the general discussion mode, this came up and uh, it was promised that we would do something about it, that is to say by way of holding a formal conversation. And so with Daniel Ward after two, and uh, we will discuss with him how government in the towns and elsewhere comes to be something of a family affair, is it? That's later. Speaking of which, for now, speaking of which, the family recalls to mind the Charles Manson family, a surviving member of which, who is uh, at liberty, at liberty to talk to us, and has uh, very kindly agreed to do, living in Vermont, is at this moment on the telephone, your contact at 886-6450 on our Watts line, 1-800-421-4259, uh, 21, 22 years ago, she was there at the ranch in California's Topanga Canyon. Uh, just one of the family of uh, young men, most of them young women, I think. Uh, I believe the women outnumbered the men. Uh, now, that was before the massacres of August 1969, of course, carried out. The court decided at the direction of Charles Manson by Charles Tex Watson and three of the young women. Sandra Good was not among them, but uh, she remembers the family. I suspect, and I would invite her to recall for us some of those days of life with the Manson family. Are you there, uh, Sandra Good? Yes, I am. Very good of you to take the call. I'm grateful. Um, this is really in order uh, that people who don't know of you that well uh, will make the connection that I thought to ask first uh, with regard to your recollections of the of the family, how you came to join their number, and uh, the sort of things in your own family environment that may have um, prompted you to leave and take up with uh, with others and consider, come to consider them your family. Do you remember those days in the 60s? <laughs> of course. I still live I still live there at the ranch. Yeah. Um, first of all, you're, you're misinformed, as is everybody misinformed about the so-called family. There was no there was no organization or group called the family. The family was a, a term given by the media to an amorphous group of people, some of whom went to prison went to jail in uh, 1969. Oh, yes. We lived uh, at a ranch in the um, Santa Susana Mountains called the Spons Ranch, mm -hmm. and later we lived in Death Valley. We didn't call ourselves anything. Uh, we made a lot of music, and somebody said, well, what, what do you call your group? And somebody said, well, we're the Family Jams. And so over a period of time, uh, because the media usually needs to put labels on, on situations, we got the name, the family, but there were literally hundreds of people that came and went. Um, later on, you might say there was a, a, a core of people who were very, very close together and who stayed uh, true to the thought that we had uh, for stopping the war in Vietnam and for protecting our air, our water, our trees, and our wildlife. Um, we were so committed to these causes that uh, the murders more or less evolved out of our desire to change the system. The family jams is J-A-M-S, as in uh, preserves, just in case people may have missed that. You remember, yeah. remember the book by Ed Sanders? He, he wrote a book called The oh, Family. Oh, yeah, Ed wrote that book for money, and it has, has nothing to do with the truth or the reality of, of what happened. He knew what would sell. He knows that certain subjects, sex, violence, cultism, etc., sell, and um, he lied. I'd say maybe 1% of that book has truth in it. The other 99% is um, lies. Uh, Manson himself never referred to his group as a family. No. Uh, you were, now, in the 1960s, more about Sandra Good. You, um, you were in a rebellious state of mind, were you? Did you come from a family environment that was uh, somehow intolerable? No, no more than any other um, person that came from my kind of environment. I came from, I guess what you'd say, an upper-middle-class family. I had been to college for a total of seven years. I, I never got a degree because I switched majors from English literature to marine biology. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of ideals. Mm -hmm. I had concepts of honor and nobility and, and things that I got from reading Shakespeare in, in, in literature. Mm -hmm. So I was a very idealistic person, and I looked around at the world I lived in and at the, uh, the government and my parents and their friends, and I saw no honor, I saw no truth, I saw no joy of living, mm -hmm. um, I saw no purpose, and mm -hmm. I didn't believe I fit. And I was looking for something 
beyond what I saw. And when I met Manson, I saw a man who was sure of himself, who was all the way alive, who didn't have doubt, who didn't need to ask a woman or, or a boss or somebody what to do. He, he was lively, he sang, he danced, um, he never lied. He was very truthful. And that attracted me as it attracted a lot of people. He didn't direct things. Mm-hmm. He more or less reflected <laughs> us back at ourselves. He saw more in us than we saw in ourselves. He saw that we were locked by our parents' doubts and our parents' programming. And um, in my case, the, the need to achieve, you know, the need to get a, a doctorate degree. I felt yes. that if I didn't get a PhD, I was a failure. I was programmed by that type of programming mm-hmm. that, that people are, you know, programmed to in this society. Each yes. of us sort of represented a different level of, of American society. Yeah, this lively he, dancing man, where did, where did you meet him? Where did, how did you come across him, I wonder? Can I was recall? living in San Francisco, wow. and I had dropped out of college, and I met an artist who had an airplane, who had a friend who had an airplane, and he wanted to fly to Los Angeles to sell some of his paintings. And so I flew with him. It was a, a two-seater plane. And he had been talking about Manson. He just kept talking on and on about Manson. Mm-hmm. He was very impressed by him, and I could care less. I wanted to go surfing. And so we, we rented a car in Los Angeles and drove to Topanga Canyon. Mm-hmm. And that's where I met Manson. And maybe there were 10 or 15 other people that were living in Topanga Canyon at that time. Yeah. And I was sort of, I was very impressed by the people all the people there that I never went back to San Francisco. I called and told my roommates to just, they could have all my possessions. I had scuba diving equipment and skis and things like that, and I never went back. Yeah, did your family reach you to express concern for your well-being? Did you ever have any contact with your family in those rebellious years? I wasn't really rebellious. Mm. Um, I didn't take drugs. I wasn't really rebellious. I was searching. And I was never really close to my parents. Mm. And I had been, you know, I was 24 years old at the time. Yeah, you're and right. I wasn't, I wasn't really beholden to them in any way. I wasn't close. So mm. I kept contact with my father, my dad. Oh, did you, yeah? Yeah, I, I would check in now and then with him. And I'm sure he was relieved to hear from you, to know that you were, uh, you were well and uh, well cared for, or looking after yourself. Um, your father, your mother, you didn't contact, didn't speak to her personally. Well, they were divorced when I was little, and yeah. I never really had much um, oh contact with my mother, even as I was growing up. Yeah. She was a social climber and involved in um, money and images, and mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And that, I, see. I saw, is a very empty, you know, it's sort of the way um, yeah. Nancy Reagan and those people are. It's a yes. very empty, superficial, hollow uh, it's really a cruel way of living. When they put money over the well-being of the planet and of their own children, you know, they care more about their social image and their status than they do, uh, uh, than they care about if there's going to be air and water to sustain mm-hmm. their own children's lives. It's not as though they will withheld their money from you, however, in uh, the course of your earlier years as a child of an upper a middle-income family. I mean, to say they uh, provided you, kept you uh, well-fed and clothed and provided you apparently with uh, amazing amazing educational opportunities if you were able to stay in college for seven years, considering Mm -hmm. the expense of college. Now, in other words, they bestowed some of this wealth you criticize on you and uh, to your advantage. They uh, they didn't spoil me. They didn't spoil me. Um, Mm -hmm. It was was the tradition to, you know, send your kids to college. And um, I lived... I lived modestly. I wasn't. I didn't have a car. I wasn't a spoiled child at all. Mm-hmm. Um, especially emotionally, I wasn't spoiled. Um, yeah. But there were really no ties or obligations to them. I worked. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't ask them for much. I didn't rebel. I didn't cause them any grief. And mm-hmm. when I became um, acquainted with what's called the Manson family, I felt more akin to these people than I ever did to my own family. Uh, They they knew they were lively people. They weren't neurotic. Um, They, we had all 
evolved in the so-called family, we shed a lot of doubt, a lot of inhibitions about um, what we could or couldn't do. We became younger. We we kind of got back to the state of being that you have as a child, where you your mind isn't full of. Um, doubt and inadequacy and you have faith in yourself so basically what happened is we reestablished the faith in ourselves that we had as children before parents and teachers and schools and all that sort of thing took the faith away from us uh, um it came uh, the month of august in 1969 were you still at the ranch when uh, susan atkins uh, linda kasabian uh, the krenwinkel woman and the charles watkins went out on the hunt were you at the ranch I was there. Yeah, you know, why Why didn't you choose to accompany them? How, how was I it? was eight months pregnant. Ah, uh, other, otherwise. And, yeah. and it wasn't my destiny to do that anyway. No, no, apparently it was not part of your And it wasn't, karma. those murders were not at the direction of Charles Manson. Those people that went out um, did so of their own free will and of their own volition, and there was reason in each person's mind for what they did. It had nothing to do with Manson's will or his direction. He had nothing to do with those murders. We, the kids that did those killings, were middle class, primarily middle class people who saw, who were raised in similar ways that I was raised, and did not like what was going on in this country. They wanted to stop the war in Vietnam. They wanted to stop the pollution. They wanted to get one of the one of their brothers out of jail who was arrested for something there were different reasons for those killings which haven't been fully explained uh it could be explained but it would take a lot of time yeah, it's interesting to hear but what happened is the prosecution the district attorney and all those people didn't want to face the fact that kids that could have been their own kids mm -hmm. did these things so they had to take a person who was raised um, on the bottom of society, <clears throat> very poor, no education or little education, uh, who had been in jail since he was nine years old. That's Manson, and they had and they said that he was the driving force behind what happened. And then the district attorney saw that a lot of money could be made through the trial, through books, through movie rights, TV. Uh, help skelter, you know, mm -hmm. uh, shows, yeah, well, and uh, mm -hmm. they covered up the truth because that's they pretty, were selling something. That's pretty much the explanation uh, Manson gives of his role in the murders, uh, claiming that the district attorney was in it only for uh, profit. Yeah, yeah. It, it continues to crop up in all his public statements, uh, and uh, that um, he was entirely innocent of uh, directing the affair. Absolutely. A jury, on the other hand, after hearing uh, just months of testimony, decided otherwise, and of course uh, uh, suggested, well, by their verdict, that Manson uh, himself was uh, the evil genius behind this uh, raid on well, what, what uh, happens, civilians. What happens uh, when a prosecution doesn't have a case? Mm -hmm. They'll take people who, have, for example, they took uh, a biker, um, who was a pretty sleazy guy, he had charges against him. They made a deal with this guy that in return for a false testimony, they would drop all his charges. This happens a lot. They cut deals. They get people to lie, and then they give the person the false identity and money and relocate them in another, in another state. Mm -hmm. They dragged up people from all kinds of places, made all kinds of deals, and they created a case that would serve the prosecution. And, and, of course, the jury looks to the judge as a father figure, and the judge is uh, working for public opinion and for money and holding hands with the DA, et cetera. So it's, it's really unfortunate these days that the courtroom is not a place where the truth comes out. Mm, yeah, it's no. a very tragic situation because what this country was founded on was the rights Mm -hmm. You know, what people died mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. were for people's rights. I understand. You're supposed to have your rights in the courtroom, and Charles Manson did not get his rights in the courtroom. All his rights to this day have been taken from him. We, so, have, uh, we have the necessity to break, mm -hmm. and uh, an announcement or two. We'll be back with you very shortly. Sandra Good. That's, is that good with an E? Or it's, there's no E on the end. There's is, no E on There's no E. Sandra Good, G-O-O-D, sounding just as it's spelled, spelt just as it sounds, and back with her very shortly. With, if you have a question, uh, 
you'd like to raise about the uh, uh, revelations in the conversation thus far or any of the uh, points you might wish to make, an observation, help yourself to some air time at 886-6450. Sandra Good is uh, your witness. And Sandra Good, your contact at 886-6450. I was going to say, in addition to it, that uh, Charles Manson feels the district attorney does it for self-aggrandizement, that the courtrooms are corrupt and the district attorney is only self-serving, seeking to line his pockets. He gives another motive for the district attorney having uh, prosecuted him, Manson, in an interview done in 1985. And I think you very kindly sent us this from uh, the California Magazine, May of 1985's interview with Charles Manson. He said, um, the district attorney has no friends. His friends is his dollar bill and his wife that tells him what to do. Dig? So I've got friends. This is, I'm, I don't do a good Charles Manson here. And he doesn't like me because I got friends. He hates me because I got friends, because he wants to have friends, but he doesn't know how to have friends. He plays tennis with himself. Is that another motive of the district attorney for prosecuting Charles Manson? Because he, the DA, doesn't have any friends. Well, you know, people that don't have substance within themselves and don't have a center in, in love and faith, yeah. in truth, they look to money. They look to, you know, they bust their rear ends on the freeway going back and forth to jobs they hate to get money to get approval mm -hmm. to get attention this is a motive in millions of people it's not just the da that's been selling lies about manson for for money and, and attention it's the media uh all the people thousands of media people etc that have been feeding off of uh manson and what they call the family the DA was a very competitive fella, and he, he did want to make a big name for himself and be a, a big somebody, and mm -hmm. he was a very jealous person. I, I had several encounters with them, yeah. and it was eating <clears throat> him up that there were so many people that were loyal to Manson. He, he couldn't, he didn't have anybody that would stand by him, mm -hmm. so th it, that eats up a lot of people when they don't have any loyalty or, or love that they can count on from somebody. Manson be. didn't need friends. He didn't need love because he's self-contained. But most people aren't self-contained, so they mm -hmm. look to money and and uh, outside approval. Here we have a couple of callers who've risen to be recognized who want to talk person to person to Sandra Good. And uh, this caller is, I believe it's Glenn. Glenn from Eden. Glenn, it's your turn on air with, you're the first to call and talk to Sandra Good. Are you there? Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Miss Good. Hello. Um, I'm listening to you with some interest and some, a lot of disagreement. Um, a lot of your ideas are very noble. Um, I also, I suspect I'm probably about your age and uh, um, lived here in the Buffalo area and was thrown out of my house at 17 after my father thought he couldn't uh, support me anymore or wouldn't and ended up in San Francisco during the 60s and actually stayed there until 1985. Um, I was caught up in all the um, uh, things in the Haight-Ashbury and, and, uh, and a lot of the, the uh, anti-war demonstrations, and of course I was anti-war, and I, I, I do agree with you about the air and the environment and the uh, lives of the media and all that stuff, but I really fail to see uh, where the Tate LaBianca murders uh, was going to solve anything. Uh, you talked about um, uh, Manson uh, not lying, and, and you didn't want to believe all the lies of the, the government, and I, I have to agree with you there. Um, but it sounds like you were sucked into a bunch of lies. It sounds like uh, you, you failed to call things a cult. You failed to uh, uh, call things as they really were. I, I, I tend to see you as blind, as uh, uh, walking with your hands over your ears and not listening to... Uh, a reality. Oh, Glenn. Yeah. I, I guess that's that's my comment. Yeah. Well, you, you use the word cult. What is a cult? Isn't the Catholic Church a cult? Well, yes. I I happen to be to be a member of uh, of a, a Christian church. I happen to believe in Jesus Christ and the and the and the, the truth that He proclaims. So um, do I. But uh, pardon me. So do I. We all. I'm really proud to hear and glad to hear you say that. Um, yeah. But what I'm what I'm trying to say is is um it sounds like manson sucked a bunch of people in no uh, no we sucked him in if anything 
we brought we brought our problems to him. Tell me what what the murders what the murders proved. What what those people, even though they were involved in the in the Hollywood scene and the money scene, which certainly wasn't you or I. Uh, what what did they what did they really accomplish those lives uh, and and the gruesomeness and the what in, in the way that they were killed. Well, there's a lot of different levels, you know, to to answering that question. A lot of different levels, but I can touch on a few. I remember in the in the penalty phase, one of the um, one of the women that was convicted of murder said, "We are your children. We are reflections of your society. <clears throat> we were raised. We have done what you've raised us up to do. We've watched your violence on television. Um, you've judged the reflection of yourself. The the um, the murders pretty much were a, a very good reflection of." Um, what this country teaches its young people to do. Now you have mass murders every day. Um, there, were, there were actual motives, um, which is complicated to get into. One was to show where the country was headed. The Tate LaBianca house was sort of a portent of where the whole country is going if we don't stop the pollution and if we don't start showing our children models of real morality. Uh, in other words, if you've got a government that lies and cheats the public out of their money and squanders the resources that we need to live, like our air and our water and our animals and our trees, and they wheel and deal and play crook, and then they, and they murder people in other countries to get their resources so we can, you know, have more oil uh, and misuse the resources. When the children grow up seeing that there's no truth and no trust and no faith and no honor in the people that are running this country, what do you expect? Well, well, so, so, the, so we wanted to stop the war. And all of what said, you're saying is so, so good and so true. Mm. I happen, you live in Vermont? Yeah. I happen to live in a very socialist state of New York with, with the dictator Cuomo in charge. Yeah. And, and taxes running rampant and, and our gas prices at the pumps are just unreal where people can't hardly afford to drive to work and he's i agree with all of that i agree with all of that but weren't we anti-war in the 60s weren't we anti-killing well you're saying one thing and doing another it's, it's, well, in order for there to be change yeah. in order for any major change to occur in any society or system there's always violence revolution implies uh, radical change and, yeah. and people get killed. And, and I just have one more comment, please, before you yeah, uh, cut me off. Very quickly, if you will, please, Glenn. Um, I, I wanted to also mention that I think really, really seriously that as a product of the 60s and, and, and a flower child, if you want to call it that, as a product of that and the free love era and all of that stuff, I think that did more damage oh. to our family and to our children of today because now we are fathers and grandfathers Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what we were then, and I see the family falling apart, and I think the family is the core of this country. Very good, that's Glenn. Right. We've got to adjourn. We've got brief headlines. Thanks, Glenn. There we are. That's Glenn from Eden. Back with you in just a minute and a half or two. Hold the phone. Sandra Good with you very shortly. Here's what's happening. Right. So he's given no rights. Yeah. More than I can't think of any other prisoner that has been more mistreated than Manson. Well, they're afraid for his safety. Is that a possibility? Someone threw no, uh, that's an excuse. flammable hey, fuel hey. on him and set him afire. Um, that was a... Manson can take care of himself. Uh, um, um, he's been doing time since he was nine years old. He knows the ways of prison. Yeah. Um, that, that fellow, that, the Hare Krishna person, mm -hmm. was pretty much programmed to do that. Uh, Charlie was very badly burned, but he healed himself miraculously in very little time. Um, he's used to sell fear to sell more crime and fear to the public to justify more millions of dollars for bigger prisons to house more uh, more people and run more fear. The more they run fear and crime into the mind of the public, the more they create crime. Yeah. It's like the prison is <clears throat> like a crime factory. And they use Manson to run fear into mm -hmm. people's minds to justify bigger taxes for more prisons. The Manson that the public... Uh, has in their mind has nothing to do with the real Manson. Uh -huh. What people think in their minds is Manson is not reality. Guy's still pretty menacing, though. He says, uh, I'll start a revolution. As a matter of fact, he says, uh, with regard to the district attorney, that if the courtrooms are in order, I'm going to sue. I'm going to sue for everything California's got. I'll own California by the time this is over. If I sue, 
And if I can't sue, that's okay, too. Then I'll start a revolution. Something. This Middle East situation... Yeah? He, Manson has been talking about this for as long as I've known him. Really? You He's think... Also, yes, exactly. Uh-huh. I have stacks of letters about, about the Middle East, the holy war that's coming, mm-hmm. and also the fact that the economy is running out. Yeah, the Manson. fact that the money's failing. As Man- long as Manson is not given his rights, as long as he's held down by little money mines, yeah. the more this country spins into hell. And I'll tell you something, this country cannot afford another war. Manson we says... We don't have the money to finance a war, and the resources of, of the world cannot sustain yeah. the burden of another war. This will be, this will be the most hideous war uh. that's, that's ever happened. Yeah. Saddam Hussein wants a dialogue with 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 uh, Bush. Bush has. I thought you were going to say with Manson for one minute. Okay, Manson with uh, Nixon. Nixon got True. up in yeah. front of the public and proclaimed Manson guilty. Oh. This was the president of the United States saying, "This is before the trial had even begun." Yeah. Nixon said that Manson was guilty. Manson wanted to face Nixon in a courtroom and have a dialogue, but mm-hmm. Nixon couldn't face him. I see. Uh, when you've got people like Bush, like Nixon, who have no no mind, no mind in the truth, all they have minds in is money. They can't face a human being who does have truth and a yeah. mind. Yeah. That's why Bush wants mm-hmm. dialogue with Hussein, and a dialogue could show the world quite a bit. All we have in this country is might and um, control, but this country has lost its power because it's lost its its foundation in any kind of truth. Uh, we'll, there will be people disappointed if I don't ring them in on the phone, disappointed okay. uh, at being unable to talk to you in this part of an hour. We've got you on the air. Uh, go right ahead. Hello there. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, good. Go right ahead. Hi, John. And Hi. Hello, Sandra. Hello. Uh-huh. Um, I'd just like to start off by saying I'm 24 years old, uh, which I heard you say you were the same age when a lot of the mass and things were happening. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I've, I've got so many questions, I'll try to pare it down. I guess, first, I'm uh, just hearing you talk about Hussein for a minute. I am not a flag waver type. I'm not, uh, I don't even uh, claim to be any kind of a political, you know, authority or anything on, on the matters of the world. But I find it really curious, Sandra, that um, a lot of people find find fault with, you know, Bush or Nixon or whoever happens to be running the country. And yet, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're implying that uh, people such as Saddam Hussein are not guilty of the same crimes, you know, moral or ethical crimes that you're claiming Bush to be guilty of. As, insofar as, uh, you know, we have might and that's all that we use. Well, it's kind of, it seems to me that that's what Hussein's using right now. Why wouldn't they let Manson speak in the courtroom? They didn't want to hear what he had to say. They were afraid of what he had to say. Now, right now, we're on the brink of war. Hussein wants to be heard. He wants to dialogue. In order to resolve any conflict or any disagreement, you have to have communication. If, I mean, this, I is agree. Basic, this is basic psychology. In family crisis situation, in any situation of, of uh, conflict, you have dialogue. The man, Hussein, is asking for the most basic necessity, and that is to have dialogue. The thing is, is the truth about the, the history of the Middle East, why, why, uh, Kuwait was annexed recently. Mm-hmm. What wasn't uh, Kuwait part of Iraq before the First World War? In other words, it gets into a whole situation of uh, Western domination of the world for for many many years prior mm-hmm. to World and, War One. Oh, I you just have find... to look at the historical con- you know context, mm-hmm. the situations, and if the public is if the United States public is continually kept misinformed about Manson about the Middle East, mm-hmm. about major mm-hmm. uh, players in this particular crisis. I, I just find it uh, fascinating that you're apparently drawing a parallel between Charles Manson and Saddam Hussein. Well, I really, I mean, mm-hmm. may, maybe it's deeper than I'm, I'm seeing. Well, but what I'm, the parallel that I'm drawing is that Manson has and has had something to say that is vital to the survival. Uh, Kuwait, part of Iraq before the First World War. In other words, it gets into a whole situation of uh, Western 
domination of the world for, for many, many years prior mm -hmm. to World and, War I. Well, the, I you have to look at the historical con you know, context mm -hmm. and situations, and if the public is, if the United States public is continually kept misinformed about Manson, about the Middle East, Mm -hmm. about major mm -hmm. uh, players in this particular crisis. I, I just find it uh, fascinating that you're apparently drawing a parallel between Charles Manson and Saddam Hussein. Well, I really, I mean, mm -hmm. may, maybe it's deeper than I'm, I'm seeing. Well, but what I'm, the parallel that I'm drawing is that Manson has and has had something to say that is vital to the survival of this country. My point, my point, if there is one, would be that just simply having something to say does not necessitate being heard or followed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, <clears throat> hundreds of evil people have had many things to say, you know, good, bad, and indifferent through the ages, and I don't think that just because they have something to say, that means that we, no, you know, we you should let follow. No, you let people judge. In other words, you've heard the expression, the truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. How can you make a judgment on something if you are misinformed about that? Now we're, we're on the verge of war. If we don't know, if we are misinformed, and the media does not tell you the truth, if you're misinformed, how can you have your own mind? What I'm saying is that 99% of the people in this country don't have a mind because they have been misinformed. Uh, They've been brainwashed to be consumers. There, now, someone just hung up a phone. I okay. Yeah, good. They've been brainwashed to be yes. consumers, and you're only <laughs> fed what people want you to know, so you'll continue in the rat race uh -huh. of serving... Uh, somebody's money interest suddenly your water's running out yeah. and your economy is shot I, I agree i agree with all with all the above um i just yeah. don't see that if i were to go and follow somebody uh who had the same ideals you know which are good ideals but the, my other point would be that uh, what was accomplished by the killings and i know somebody just asked that and you you answered these people were a reflection of what their parents had made them to be, okay. you know, et cetera. And I do see that. I do see what you meant by that. You know, but in, a, in a situation like, you know, what we have today in the Middle East, you know, I, I really couldn't make the connection. It can uh, it can be the explanation as Sandra Good uh, gave it and uh, the, the murders as she views them. It could be uh, more easily explained. It's a possibility in it terms of... It was partly a revolution <coughs> against pollution. Well, it could be, yeah. I, a revolution yeah. against pollution. Our main thought has been to save our air, our yeah. water, our trees and our wildlife. And that's why uh, Sharon Tate had a dinner fork stuck in her womb. No, that no, 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 no. Sharon Tate's womb was not touched, and the coroner's report can can verify that. Lino LaBianca had war written across his chest, mm -hmm. and, a, and a fork put in his yeah. chest. And the <clears> woman <throat> that did it said, "That's one man that won't be sending his son to yeah. war." Can it be more easily explained, really, in terms of benumbed youth, hideously mind controlled, high no, on no, drugs no, 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 after years of drug consumption? After years of drug consumption, John, I was, I was wondering. I was wondering when you were going to spring to life here. Um, I, well, I, heard I, you, I heard you months ago with Jeffrey Giuliano, and I was yeah. wondering when this was. Oh, well, it's, 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 well, this is one of the more difficult discussions, far more difficult than let Jeffrey Giuliano, let me assure you. Let me ask you both something. Oh, yeah. What are you going to do when your air and your water runs out? When you can't... In New York, I know I know what Cuomo and what big industry is doing to your water. Mm -hmm. I, I, Senator, let me say do? that I respect life to the utmost, as you obviously will you claim fight, to. Will you fight to save your own life in the air and the water in the trees? I will do so, but not by taking another human life. Yeah, well, it's occurred to me... Survival? You might find it very useful to threaten uh, uh, other people. You might, you might, uh, if, if it comes to that, if we lose our air and water, we might, both of us, uh, send off threatening letters to leading executives of business concerns. I'd hope you do more than that. I'd hope you have the instinct for well, your own life and for your children's I'll, life to do I'll whatever it takes. I'll let it go with threats to do them bodily harm. You, uh, you so were you'll just lay down and let big yeah. industry destroy your children's future? Is that what you're saying? You were convicted we go, of that, we were weren't to, you? If we were to... <laughs> I would feel that I was giving in. If I were to succumb to the pressures and and take take life in the name of of, of air and water and trees and stopping an insane war to to get more oil to save a way of life that destroys life. Well, let, uh, let me let me just pose this to you: being I am I am the same age you were when this was happening. I'm not I'm not comparing Vietnam to the situation in the Middle East right now. But do you still believe that we can achieve our ideals? You know, using basically the same means that that the Manson quote family unquote used. Mm -hmm. I'm saying we're on the brink of a war mm -hmm. to save, as Bush said, a way of life. Okay. This way of life that Americans are living is destroying our air, our water, our land, and our wildlife. Mm -hmm. The I, oil I consumption must stop. Now, what I'm saying is, is allow 
in this particular case right now, Hussein is saying, let's dialogue. Mm -hmm. Let's dialogue. Let's let the truth come out and let the people hear. The same thing happened during the Tate LaBianca murders. If the truth of those murders had been allowed to be explained, if Manson had been given his rights and a voice in the courtroom, much of the calamity that this country is in right now could have been averted. I, I see Ma Manson as being um, savior to us all. Listen, we got the, we got a break. <laughs> I appreciate it. He's a very wise man. Yeah, oh boy. Okay. Thank okay, you for your John, call. Thank you. Appreciate it. Eight eight six six four five zero. With the more to come, sign up. Another few minutes with Sandra Good. <laughs> Hi, this is Rick Jenneret. Join me for all the exciting play-by-play -play action of Sabres hockey, home and away, on the radio home of the Sabres, WGR News Radio 55. If a new entry door or patio door is somewhere on your building or remodeling list this year, move it to the top right now. Because Big L Distributors Western New York's window and door specialist has good news for you. It's Big L's giant truckload sale with savings on the entire line of remarkable permadoors like the new stainable high-performance handcrafted fiberglass door designed and engineered to give you the look of wood without the high price and frequent maintenance. Also, there's great savings on permadoor insulated steel entrance doors, the strongest steel doors in America. Big L's giant truckload sale also features Dexter lock sets. With Dexter by Master Lock, you have elegantly crafted entrance handles, lock sets, and accessories at prices that are surprisingly accommodating. Best of all, the Dexter lock sets carry a lifetime warranty on workmanship and materials. Remember, you'll find no better prices this year on Permadores and Dexter locks than at Big L Distributors' giant truckload sale. During the month of August only, previous orders excluded. Big L Distributors, 1800 Broadway and 1060 Niagara Falls Boulevard. Do you find yourself working just to watch TV? And it's going back! Maybe it's time for a TV with remote or a VCR with remote. Get an LXI 19-inch color TV or an LXI VCR for just $2.69 through Saturday at Sears Brand Central. So sit where you are and relax for just $2.69. Brand Central at Sears, the brands you want at the store you trust. Price and date may vary in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Get the rest of the story from Paul Harvey weeknights at 5.30 on News Radio 55 WGR. Now, back to John Otto. We'll have you on with Sandra Good. It's five before two and just a few minutes remaining, but I did want to get it on the record. The, uh, the Manson family, female family associates, uh, how, uh, female associates, I'll let it go at that, they have shown a uh, propensity uh, for violence otherwise beyond the murders incalculably grim. Uh, Lynette uh, Frohm, September 5th, 1975, tried to do in President Ford in Sacramento. And I am accurate in saying that you were charged with and convicted of sending threatening letters to executives of business organizations? Um, Lynette pointed a gun, a loaded gun, at the president, but she failed to uh, put the, um, the uh, bullet in the chamber. She could have if she wanted to, but she didn't. Oh, she she could have killed the president, but she chose not to. Yeah. It's a okay. Rather At the violent, same time, eh? I had 3,000 letters to the heads of corporations and industries throughout the United States and some in, in Europe that are destroying the air, the water, the land, and the wildlife. They weren't personal threats. They were simply saying uh, what would happen if they continued to destroy what keeps people and what sustains life. Mm -hmm. They weren't on a personal level because there's no way that I could personally give these people the justice that they're calling for. Yeah. As people start dying, as their air and water runs out, and their children are getting cancer, and they're getting cancer, and um, things become intolerable in this country, people will wake to what has destroyed the economy and, what has de and who has destroyed the ecology, and people will lose their minds and, mm. and rise up and do whatever they do. Yeah. It'll, it, madness mm. is coming. I can believe I didn't it, yes. I didn't personally threaten anybody. One of the um, radio interviews that I gave was to uh, Hamilton, Ontario, mm -hmm. which is right across the border from you. Sure. I got five years for that interview, and I've got the interview right here, and there is no threatening um, for heaven's words sake. in this interview. I see. I, I created fear in the um, corporate world because they don't want to be exposed. Mm -hmm. They don't. I was naming names. And they don't want people to know how they're destroying life on Earth. Here we are with, uh, we got, perhaps this might be the parting shot. We got John, maybe time only for one more. John, you're on. WG, are you there? Hello, John. Yeah, John, go right ahead. Uh, 
you're going to send me that book sometime? It's, it's in process, John. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, okay. In fact, it's, it's in the mail. Great. I don't know that the zip code is uh, sufficient. It was only nine, but we let it go. Toronto, nine, Ontario. Yeah, we let it go at that, John. Okay. I got, I'd like to ask the young lady uh, three questions. Okay? Yeah, go right ahead. You may have time only for two, John. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, do you believe that uh, God created uh, humankind? God? Do you believe in God? I, I like to use the word intelligence. Um, Answer the question, yes or no? No. I'd say all life is intelligence, and you can call it God, yes. You can do you call believe it God. that God created humankind, yes or no? Well. Um, I'd say that all all life is part of God, or you can call it intelligence. All life has intelligence, from the bugs to the trees to... You're beating around the bush, yes or no? Well, apparently, uh, well, what is God? God is a word. Okay. Are you Second. talking about an anthropomorphic God, a big, a big daddy in the sky? Okay. Yeah, you well, won't answer the question. Your interrogation will have to be brief for John. Okay. Yeah. Second, second question. Sure. Uh, do you believe that uh, uh, murderers should be executed? Can yes or no? Um. Uh, convicted murderers should be executed. Yes or no? I believe that if you're going to execute one murderer, mm -hmm. you should execute all of them. And that's from the President of the United States who sends millions of young men to oh. kill and die in wars for big money. Okay. There you are. Why, are John, your, uh, John, why is the family alive in uh, California we, prisons? We, we, because we. they didn't, because they... Um, why are they alive? Because the death penalty was overthrown, because they didn't deserve to die. Ah, very good. Because if you're going to execute one person, you have to have equal justice for all. On In that this note, country, there is not on that note of justice. equal justice for all, Sandra Good, we must, uh, with regret, conclude. We'll talk another time, I hope. Thank you very much for your willingness to sit in with us this afternoon. Sandra Good, thank you. Could you put that here? WGR News Radio 550 AM, celebrating 68 years of service in Buffalo. Thanks for listening. It's 73 degrees under clear skies. I'm Ray Marks in the WGR News Center. All right. Uh, I was in prison with Charles Manson, and this person told me this is interested in it. And I, I have first-hand experience with him. Matter of fact, I was lived right next to him in the hole when he was in uh, isolation. They let, let him out into the regular prison population after he'd been locked up like 11 years in protective custody against his will. Uh, but that is what I want to talk about right now. What I want to talk about is, is that when a guy threw a, I don't know if it was lighter fluid or just something flammable that was in the occupational therapy shop there in Vacaville, but uh, I was an aide in there. Twice a week, I, I'd always be in there to help the psychiatric patients, show them how to make ceramics and all that. You have to have a card to get in there. Well, Charlie had a card. He used to like to make things, you know, ceramics, braiding, work. Uh, rugs, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I was in the day he got burned up. I, me and a guy named Wally, I don't remember his last name, we were about three feet away with the Hardy Christian dude or whatever he was, walked up to front of Charlie. And I don't remember exactly what he said, but he had one hand behind his, his back, like he had a knife or something behind his back, and he had a cup of coffee in his hand. And I was watching what was happening. Charlie was watching his hand. And that's what I would have done, too. I figured the guy, why he got his hand behind his back? He's got a knife in his hand, you know. So while he's watching the, the right hand, the guy throws a cup of coffee on Charlie, but it wasn't coffee, it was flammable fluid. Then the right hand came across with a cigarette lighter and uh, he torched him. At that time, at that time, uh, Wally had one of the uh, canvases that had been in the paint area but she threw over Charlie while well, I grabbed Charlie by the legs and held him because he was only burning from like the chest up, you know. He had him under there and Charlie was going, I'm suffocating. So uh, the guy said, okay, I let it off and the flame, the flame came right back once it was, it was being smothered, you know. But you know how some flammable liquids, they're funny, you know. So anyway, then I had, I took my jacket off and put it over the guy. And he put the canvas over him again. Anyway, it took about a minute and a half to put it out completely. After we were done, his hair was all singed, his eyebrows were singed, his forehead was burnt. The back of his hands were burnt pretty bad because he went like that when the guy threw his stuff on him. And uh, that's about it. I mean, I didn't think it was uh, that big of a thing, but I guess uh, it's something that's first hands from somebody that knew him personally for a while. 
And uh, I'm going to try to stick up with Charles Manson because he has done a lot of fucked up things in his life. But uh, he's just a product of uh, reform schools back in Tennessee, a federal prison. Most people don't know anything about that. He didn't get famous until 69 when all that crap happened out here. But he'd been locked up all his life as a kid himself. So he was he was a institutionalized, programmed animal, you know. And when he got a chance to get out there with all these young, beautiful girls and young guys and stuff, and turn them all on the acid and stuff. This is a '69. Acid was still very popular. He did it. All he wanted to do was party and fuck and have a good time because he'd been locked up his whole life. And these kids started wigging out and shit. And they came to him and asked him, "We want to start a revolution, Charlie. How do we start a revolution?" And he says, "Well, the public and politicians." Everybody out here, rich people, they're like jackasses. You got to hit them right between the between the eyes and get their attention first. They said, "Well, how do we do that, Charlie?" He says, "You got to scare them. You know, bodies might work." But he never directly told anybody. You can even ask Tex Watson, who really is is the kid. He's the one to kill everybody. You know, the girls didn't even do nothing. All they did was assist him in holding Sharon Tate at the Tate House and. Rosemary and Leo LaBanca, they didn't stick nothing. And Tex Washington is the one who killed everybody, okay? He was bummed out of his mind on dope and shit, and he wanted to be a leader of a revolution and press Charlie. You know, uh, Charlie's a victim of circumstances. You know, they, they can't tie one murder to him. They can't tie one actual murder to him. Gary Hyman, all he did, he cut his ear off. Shorty Shea, they say he's buried in nine places somewhere out around, in Spanga Canyon out around the Spam Ranch. Well, his body ain't showed up yet. They can say anything. The guy had just been locked up all his life. He was out there having a good time, leaving everybody alone. And uh, I don't know. They just couldn't stand it. You know, they wanted to put him back where they felt he belonged. So they built all these murders and everything else up around his name. You know, no, I'm not saying he was innocent. But he didn't actually murder anybody, you know. And not at all. He, the press, and everybody else, turned him into your modern-day Frankenstein. I mean, he's right up there with Adolf Hitler, Stallion, uh, like the top ten hated ever been. Uh, but he's not that. He's a little guy, man. You know, uh, 13, 14 year old could probably beat Charlie up. You know, he's just a little guy, man. Uh, we've been locked up all his life and got out, wanted to have a good time. And uh, things got out of control, you know, and that's, uh, that's, that's about all I really, what it, what it is, is the wrong people got killed, really, no one should die. But Sharon Tate, I, if my information is correct, her father was Admiral Tate of the U.S. Navy. She was a movie star, you know what I'm saying? And they tied these bizarre killings in with him through the people who were living with him out, you know, with him out at the Span Ranch. And uh, I don't know, it's just, it's not like, it's not like it's told. The story's been told a million times, but uh, Charlie ain't had no reason to lie to me. He's, he's never getting out. What's he gonna lie about? If he did it, he'd, he'd tell him, yeah, I did it, so what? He didn't do none of this shit, man. You know, and uh, he'll die in prison. Whether it's old age or stabbed to death, or, live, or unless the cops set him up, see the, the cops can't afford to let him get killed. You know, it would be a, it would look bad. You know, that's why he kept him in protective custody for eleven years. But uh, the guy I saw was real generous. You know, I never really seen him raise his voice to anybody except the cops when they dog him out. Took his false teeth. Took his false teeth. He, he couldn't eat nothing without his false teeth. You know, <laughs> put him in a strip cell with no mattress, nothing. The sink and the shit are turned off. They flush the toilet once a day. They give him some water when they feel like it. And uh, he's just another product, man. So this is, you know, that's that's all I really. That's what this. That's what you wanted. That's that's enough right there.